in um, the chat. We'll put some numbers in the chat and we really encourage you to take care of yourself, reach out for support if you need to, and also link into your own support networks. As I said, we've got a fantastic attendance, so there'll be time for questions later. Um, and we may not, because we've got so many people, we may not get to all questions, but there may be things that Tracy and Camille can take on notice and get back via us. Um, but before we, <coughs> excuse me, but before we start, Tandem, we've got some information that we'd like to share with you. And Sarah, are you here? Yes, I am. I'm right here. Oh, okay. Thanks, Sarah. So I thought I'd hand over to you just to spend a few minutes to update to update us. But I also want to remind people at the end of the session, just before we finish off, we're going to hear from Joe from Tandem as well, who's going to talk to you um, about some of the work we're doing in regards to the Carer Recognition Act. That's the federal act. And we're sending out a survey and would like to talk to you and ask you about your thoughts. So I'll hand you over to Sarah for now. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Wendy. Um, and this is just uh, a quick update. Um, just to let everyone know of some um, upcoming work that Tandem will be doing around the new Mental Health and Wellbeing Act. Uh, so Tandem's received some funding from the Department of Health to support families, carers and supporters to understand their rights and the changes uh, under the new Act. Um, so over the coming weeks and, and months, um, we'll be working on producing some tailored resources for family carers, which we'll share through our networks uh, through the e-news um, and on a dedicated page on our website. Um, we're also, um, we'll be working with others in the sector um, to share and, and distribute our mutual resources. Um, so many in the sector have also received funding from the department. So this is part of a broader um, system effort to support the workforce to understand their obligations under the new Act uh, and consumers, families, carers and supporters to understand their rights under under the new Act. Um, we'll also be hitting the road um, and doing a series of in-person engagements and information sessions with local family care groups uh, and we'll be doing some online um, engagements as well. Um, we're still planning things out um, but once we've um, figured out um, a schedule we'll be in touch with people and of course we'll be um, communicating through our e-news and socials. Uh, but we do have a few um, initial engagements planned, including a rights talk on the new Act at the Thames uh, Watch event on August 15th, uh, and we'll be in Bendigo for the August members meeting, uh, and we'll be doing a stopover in Ballarat, um, where we'll be talking about um, the new Act uh, and other things as well on the agenda, um, and some of the those important changes um, for families and carers. So all of these details will be in this this coming Tuesday, um, Tuesday's in news. Thanks, Wendy, that's it from me. Great, thanks, Sarah, lots going on. Um, well, we've got Tracy and I think Camille's with us as well. So I'm going to hand you over um, and introduce you obviously to Tracy Taylor. So Tracy is the Senior Advisor of Lived Experience at the Mental Health Tribunal and Camille Woodward is the Senior Legal Member. So welcome Tracy and Camille. Um, let's hear from you. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you. Excuse me, I seem to be having a few issues. Can, can people see me or not? No. No, I've got my camera on, but it doesn't appear to be doing anything. So if anybody's got any hints on how to fix that, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so not to hold things up. Um, my name is Tracy Taylor. I'm the Senior Advisor Lived Experience at the Mental Health um, Tribunal. And we also have today with us Camille Woodward, who is our Senior, senior Legal Member. Um, do you mind if I share my screen? I've got some slides. Is that okay? Yeah, you should be able to do that, Tracy. I think we've made you co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. Let's hope Thank we can you. do that. Okay. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. 
Perfect. So you can't see me, but you can see the slide. So that's the important bit. Um, okay, so thank you everybody again for attending. Um, we were thrilled to get this opportunity um, to, to present because you know we, we really value the role of, of carers um, at the tribunal. So I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and any Aboriginal people that may be here with us today. Um, obviously, we're probably coming from many lands, so I'd just like to acknowledge that. So what is the Mental Health Tribunal? Um, we were established under the Mental Health Act of 2014. Um, that will soon be changing to the Mental Health and Wellbeing Act of 2022. At the moment, we have 139 uh, members and that's supported by our registry team and um, admin. So each tribunal division is made up of three members, one from each of the following categories. So there's a community member, a psychiatrist or a registered medical member and a legal member. And um, we are very much recovery focused, person centred and absolutely support self-determination. So Camille, are you there? Sorry, I think she's having problems getting in. Oh my goodness. Um. Don't worry. <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's just one of those things. I'm just looking to see if yeah. I can see her. So, um. yeah, she's saying she hasn't been invited in as yet. Okay. Wendy, I don't know if I saw Camille in the Teams meeting, not in the Zoom meeting. Okay, I'm not. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Does somebody who have who has her email address mind sending her a quick message to let her know the Zoom link? Because I've messaged her in the in the Teams chat, but I'm not sure if she's seen that message. Okay. Okay. Just... Thank you. Thank you. Look, I, I can keep going anyway. Let's not hold that up. When Camille comes, she can um, jump in and take over. Um, okay, so the different types of orders that can be made. Um, if a person is put on a temporary treatment order by their treating team, they must, and then they apply to the tribunal, there must be a determination um, within 28 days of that. And the same if a person's on a community treatment order and um, the treating team want to have that varied to an inpatient treatment order, um, that has to be done within 28 days. Um, a person can apply to have their order revoked. A treating team can apply to um, authorise treatment for ECT. And then there's some other ones, um, they're not as common. So you've got your secure treatment orders, um, applications for neurosurgery and court secure treatment orders. Could I just ask a question, please? It's Rowena. Ooh. Hi, Rowena. Hi, are you talking about the new, like the changes that will happen or is this existing? This is existing, but we will go on to talk about the changes that are happening as well. So we've sort of um, tried to blend it in, into one because we're aware that, you know, the new Act is coming in really soon. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. So the definition of mental illness. Um, it's defined as a medical condition that's categorised by a significant disturbance of thought, mood, perception, or memory. Um, there's lots of reasons why a person is not considered to have a mental illness. So that might be things like um, sexuality, religious beliefs, um, gender, all sorts of stuff there. I won't read out the slides because I will make um, a copy of these available afterwards. When making treatment orders, our members uh, need to 
um, consider the test. So under the current act at the moment, um, the test is that a person has a mental illness and because of that mental illness, a person needs immediate treatment to prevent serious deterioration in that person's mental or physical health or serious harm to the person or another person. And that immediate treatment will be provided and that there's no less restrictive means available to enable that to um, happen. So if the patient um, ticks all those boxes, then um, the tribunal members will determine whether to make an inpatient or a community treatment order. So at the moment, it's um, a, a, for an inpatient maximum of six months um, for adults or three months if they're under the age of 18 and a community treatment order. Currently, it's 12 months with the new act um, that will be cutting down to six months. Tracy, can I just ask, Rita's popped in a question to say, does dementia come under that um, as being seen as a mental illness? Uh, I'd like to refer to Camille on that one. Yep. <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm wanting to say yes, but I, I, she is the lawyer, so I'd like her to confirm that. So when Camille pops in, can I get her to answer that, if that's okay? Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm actually here if you can hear me. Oh, oh Camille. Oh, yes. Welcome. Well, Thank you. For some reason, my camera is not on. Apologies to everybody for my arrival oh. at this time. Um, um, I, I, I can certainly answer that one if you like. Um, under the definition of mental illness, um, which actually I think goes through to the next slide, um, it talks about um, mental illness is characterised by a, sig a significant disturbance um, of, <clears throat> excuse me, thought, mood, perception or memory. Um, so arguably under the, um, uh, the umbrella of memory, um, dementia could be uh, categorised as a, a mental illness. Yep. Hope that answers the question. Thanks, Camille. And Camille, would you like to take over from here, please? <laughs> yeah, so, just, um, so moving right along. Um, so uh, we've just made a decision about, um, sorry, what we have to have regard to when we're deciding, um, as well as deciding the criteria, which I think Chris has just talked about, um, we also must have regard to, or take into consideration really, um, the person's views and preferences, um, any preferences expressed in an advanced statement uh, they may have made, um, views of the nominated person, views of guardian, uh, views of the carer, views of a parent if, if the person's a child, um, and also if uh, views of department um, where the person's subject to some form of overarching um, um, support or guardianship um, by, through the department. Um, I will say as a sitting member, we always ask um, if there's an advanced statement and our, our registry team are brilliant um, and we'll always make sure it's provided to us. So we, we read it before we um, commence the hearings. We are um, fully aware of um, whether there is one or not. Um, as well as um, um, hearing uh, um, sorry, hearings about um, treatment orders, we also um, consider applications for ECT. And I think that's our next slide. Um, and that, that's a form of treatment, electroconvulsive therapy. Um, and in deciding that um, we have to have regard to, really it's a two um, person test whether the person has capacity to make their own decisions and finally um, and, and also whether there's a less restrictive way a person could be treated um, meaning other than ECT potentially um, we that, that's essentially the two the two tests that we must decide under the current act and the new act um, uh, the mental health and well-being act um, per person is deemed to have capacity um, it's just when the the treating team um, make a decision to apply to the tribunal um, for, to, for authorization, they have to have made that assessment that the person doesn't have it um, for one reason or other. And that is that they're not able to 
um, understand information. They're not able to remember information. They're not able to uh, weigh it up, essentially um, take on board information and use it in some way. Um, or they're not able to communicate um, the decision. Um, I, think I wanted to say that um, importantly, our hearings are closed um, to the public. I think that's pretty obvious reasons. Um, the tribunal, we really try very much to have a solution focused model. Um, we're not bound by strict rules of evidence and procedure. Uh, we must um, always have regard to rules of procedural fairness. Um, and, and by that, I mean simply you know, considering whether a person has been provided with the report prior to the hearing, um, have they had time to absorb the information, um, have they had access to a lawyer, we have to really consider um, would they benefit from that. And really um, that often plays into decisions um, to put hearings off, even though we must be exceptional. But it really, I think um, our members really have regard to um, fairness uh, above everything else because it is a traumatic experience for the person. Um, Tribunal is not, as I said, uh, bound by strict rules of evidence and we can inform our, ourselves in um, any manner as um, deemed appropriate. I know um, a hearing I went to was involved in, a person had uh, drawn some drawings which they provided to us, um, poetry. Sometimes that's important for the person that, um, um, to convey their views about things. Um, other just we're required to consider to deal with matters expeditiously. Uh, and I said a little as little formality and techni technicality as, as required. Um, so it's not, we're not in court and we don't use the language of court. Um, and I can only speak from my own experience, but um, for me, um, the person, the patient is for me always front and center. And so I think that's uh, when I come to a hearing or I'm involved in a hearing, that's what I'm thinking about how are they feeling? Um, they're overwhelmed by using really foreign technical language, which we don't need to use. Um, yeah, that's all I was gonna say about that. <clears throat> I think we're up to the new act come one September. Um, Tracy, would you uh, want to, do you want yeah. me to talk about that? or? Yeah. No, I can speak to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as you're probably all aware, we have a new Act coming on 1st of September, and this is encompassing the recommendations from the Royal Commission. Um, and there's a lot in there about lived experience, and there's a lot in there about family and carers, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, so the framework um, under the Mental Health and Wellbeing Act is recovery focused and it does want to hear that patient's voice which is so so important. Um, fundamentally the legal framework for determining if a treatment order should be in place by the tribunal that's largely unchanged um, however, that lens that the information is viewed through and listened to um, is enshrined into the Me Mental Health and Wellbeing Act so, uh, and, and how people weigh things up. And importantly um, for treaters uh, and um, when they're having regard to uh, considering whether to place a person under involuntary treatment order or criteria, um, they really must have um, regard to those principles, um, as do we. And I'll I'll speak about that shortly. I think Tracy's going to talk about some of the principles. Yeah. So we haven't included all of the principles. There's 13 principles in the new act, but we haven't included all of them. We've sort of included the ones that we thought um, would be important to tandem members. So um, the first one that I want to talk about was the supported decision making principle. Um, so. This principle talks about people receiving mental health and wellbeing um, services are to be supported to make decisions and to be involved in decisions about their assessment, treatment and recovery. And that includes when they're receiving compulsory treatment. So that means that the views and preferences of the person are given um, priority. The next one is the lived experience principle. So again, um, as you're probably aware, there's a lot in the new act about lived experience, which is a wonderful shift. Um, so lived experience 
must be taken into account and, and it's recognised and valued um, in, in the new system. This one's really important for you guys. Uh, so the family and carers principle. So family carers and supporters, including children of a person receiving mental health and wellbeing services are to be supported in their role in decisions about the person's assessment, treatment and recovery, which I think is a great addition. And then we've got the dignity of risk principle. Um, so this means that a person receiving mental health and wellbeing services has the right to take reasonable risks in order to achieve personal growth, self-esteem and overall quality of life. Respecting this right in providing mental health and wellbeing services involves balancing the duty of care owed to all people experiencing mental health illnesses or psycholo psychological distress with actions to afford each person the dignity of risk. I, for all of us, our dignity of risk, some people is quite low and some people we may look at and go, oh, that's very high, but we still have to respect um, a person's dignity of risk. Okay, um, Camille, did you want to yes. speak to this Thanks. one? Yes, um, we thought that um, for this group, you might be very interested to know about support and um, specifically nominate support persons and advanced care um, statements of preferences. Um, under the new legislation, um, the role is it's slight difference. Um, and principally, the role of the nominated person is to advocate for the views and preferences as expressed by the patient. I suppose that's a, it's a, a language shift, but um, the previous or the current legislation, um, I think it was um, to support. Whereas this one really, I think, um, puts the person's um, views and pre preferences, I think, front and centre. Um, it's also to support the person to make and participate in decision making, to advocate for any supports that the, they feel the person might need to assist in um, being able to communicate or participate in decision making, um, to support the patient to understand information, um, communicate their views and preferences, to receive information and be consulted. Um, and I was just um, going to reflect on um, chapter two um, in the new legislation, the Mental Health and Wellbeing Act, which is about protection of rights. And it really is, really puts um, it back onto the treating, I think described as a designated health service, but really it's incumbent on the health service um, to inquire whether the, per, um, the patient has a nominated support person or an advanced statement, and then, um, not just make that inquiry and go, okay, they've got one, not have a cursory, oh yes, tick the box, but also then to take steps um, to uh, involve the nominated person um, um, and in, in discussions and to provide information to the nominated person, um, which I think is, is important and, and fundamental shift. Um, and the next slide I think is, about advanced statements, um, often referred to, we have advanced statements in under the 2014 Act. And as I said, we as a tribunal members, and I can only speak for my own experiences there, but we always um, look at them and have regard, um, have regard to them. Uh, in this piece of legislation, uh, the Mental Health and Wellbeing Act, there's also opportunity for people to make advanced statements about their preferences how they'd like to be considered, how they'd like to be treated. Um, I read one um, um, just recently when the person talked about the kind of food they would like, which, you know, had a giggle, but I thought that's really important. They made the point, hospital food's awful, and could someone think about what I might like? And silly sometimes, but on one view, but I think important for the person in feeling perhaps safe and comfortable. Um, and carers... Um, Obviously, can encourage uh, their loved one to make an advance statement. Um, just something that we thought we'd put out there. Um, and as I said, we must have regard to that. Um, and I was just going to, on that note, um, talk about our role. Um, while the, the legislation is really importantly um, makes it very clear that um, treaters if I can use that word, and, um, and uh, caregivers um, in terms of hospital mental health services must 
um, consider the, the principles under the Act, the mental health and wellbeing principles, um, so too the tribunal has an obligation under um, section 333 of the Act to really consider, have proper consideration um, to the mental health wellbeing um, principles when, in all our decision making. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean going through each one, each of the 13 principles and weighing them up, but it's about in, in the circumstances, um, um, having not just a cursory um, reflection, but taking it into account and how it might um, in, influence, I guess, a, a decision. Sometimes there are competing, um, sometimes principles may be in competition. Uh, views of a carer sometimes may be different to views of the person. Um, but it's about how you weigh that up. And um, we're duty bound really to take it into account. That's what I was gonna say about that. Okay, Tracy. Hey, yeah. So um, how carers can support a loved one? We sort of had a bit of a, a think about this. And we thought about, does the person, the patient have the right to deny access to a hearing? Sometimes um, patients can turn around and say that they don't want their family um, at a hearing for various reasons. It might be that they don't want their family to hear about their drug use or just as an example. Um, sometimes in hearings um, that might pop up, but the treating team, sorry, not the treating team, the, the tribunal members may then turn around and, and speak to the person and say, oh, well, you know, we can see, for example, that you might be thinking about going back to live with mum and dad. Um, can we let them in for a little bit just to have their say? Um, so we do try and encourage encourage that um, where it's necessary and where it's reasonable. Um, there is on our website a link to a form called What I Want to Tell the Tribunal. Um, it's aimed at patients, but we um, are always happy to receive those from carers if you do want to um, put something in writing that you want the members to see. Um, just bearing in mind that um, that information does get given to the, the patient. Um, if there is something that you think would damage the relationship, um, you would need to speak to the treating team and they would need to put in an application um, for a hearing, which normally happens just before the hearing. And it's called uh, a deny doc documents hearing. Um, so sometimes members can make the decision that certain information isn't given to the patient if it's going to be harmful to them or, or to another person or, or, or to a significant relationship. Um, there's a really good online tool that the Mental Health Legal Centre um, have set up and it sort of has different links. So there's some there for carers, there's some there for family, some there for patients. Um, I encourage you to have a look at that because it sort of tells you all the steps and, and how to go about that. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Camille? No, I was, I was just going to say, um, Really, um, as, as, as Tracy's already said, that sometimes patients or person doesn't want their loved one in the hearing and it and it's, um, can be really stressful um, and distressing for everybody. Um, it's really about a person case by case. Um, we practice solution focus and sometimes it's not just uh, necessary to say no. Um, I suppose your default position is um, patients' rights, confidentiality, um, they should say, they should have the say, the most say. Uh, but sometimes it's a matter of, uh, well, you know, I think a good example, I think Tracy already said, but if you want to, um, you, you're saying to us, you want to live at your parents' house, perhaps we need to know a little bit about that. Perhaps we need to hear from your parents if that's to say that that's okay. And so it might be, we have to um, navigate that. I think the, the best answer is it really needs, it will depend on the circumstances. It may not be a, um, a blanket, no, you can't attend. But then having said that, there are other ways of um, trying to put, um, if you're having concerns about being able to express your view in a hearing, sometimes it's a, it might be a way to talk to the treating team to put forward 
um, your views so that um, they can be um, aired without potentially that risk. Sometimes it's a delicate um, of, of conflict. Thank you. Okay, so how carers can inter interact with the tribunal. Um, as I said before, there is that what I want to tell the tribunal worksheet um, and then you just email that through to registry. We encourage family and carers to attend in person. Um, the members really do take on board you know, all views. Um, so Camille, would you like to speak to the rest of that slide um, please? I think, yeah, sorry, I probably touched on it a bit too early, but as I was saying in um, the new legislation to chapter two, that uh, the the treating team, the uh, mental health care uh, team is uh, obliged to um, consider whether a person um, has a nominated person or advanced statement, and if so, um, take active steps really to um, provide the nominated person with information um, and to involve them in the treatment, patient's treatment plan. Um, and, and through that, um, as I said already, the, the nominated person's role is to uh, essentially support uh, the person to make decisions. Um, rights of a guardian, um, I think similarly, um, it's part of the test um, for uh, usually the treating team authorised psychiatrists when making any decision, um, they must have regard to um, when determining a treatment order, they must have regard to the views and preferences of the patient. Um, and also um, that in, there's a long list, but that includes guardian, uh, carer, um, parent if the child's under 16, um, um, others. Um, Again, compulsory notifications, as I understand under the new act, that um, one, if a person is um, um, admitted as an involuntary uh, patient or their uh, their order is varied and they're readmitted to hospital, um, the, the, there are a per certain people that must be notified under the legislation. And I think that includes, I'll we'll check, but, um, nominated person <clears throat> and guardian. Um, I think there's lots of questions in the chat. So I was wondering whether- yeah. There are lots of questions. There's lots. Yeah. I, I, I was actually going to acknowledge that I can see this. It's up to 34 <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> um, but if I look at it, I, I'm, I think it's gonna pop up on my screen. So I was gonna acknowledge that as soon as I um, we finish the presentation, I'll go through that chat and answer any questions that I can. Um, so just one other thing um, here is with the new act, um, IMA is going to be an opt out. So everybody that receives a notice of hearing will now, um, that will be sent through to IMA after the 1st of September um, for an advocate. Um, and that's an opt out service. So if a person doesn't want it, that's okay. They can opt out and they'll keep a register of who has opted out. But I think it's a fantastic uh, thing that it, every person now will have contact um, with an advocacy service. So, what if you don't want, I touched on this before, what if you don't want your loved one? to know what you've said, if you think that that's, that could be detrimental to um, your relationship with them. Um, there's just a bit of information there about the uh, denied documents. We call them den docs. So denied documents. Um, and you can also speak to the treating team if you've got concerns about what you want to share. Um, and then they would put in that application. So the best advice there, speak to the treating team, let them know and ask them um, to, for, to apply for a, a, a DENDOX hearing. Um, and what do you do if you, if you disagree, if you're unhappy with your loved one's treating team or treatment, if you disagree about a decision or sometimes carers and families can disagree um, about an order being revoked as well. Again, speak to your treating team, speak with Tandem. Um, and if it's about the treating team treatment, um, contact the Mental Health Complaints Commission. 
Um, so that's that, that can be a really difficult space sometimes. Yeah. Camille, would you like to add anything to that? Um, it, I was just, I suppose, acknowledging that it, it can be often um, very difficult and emotionally um, very challenging for everybody um, who often has, a um, person may have a very strong view about um, their health journey and loved ones may have a different perspective or have seen, um, unfortunately, it's, uh, the trajectory or the journey, witness that. Um, yeah, I, I can't, I think that, you, the best would be take it up with the team. Um, obviously, um, potentially, if you if you're able to um, advocate, um, if if your loved one has it, um, obviously the first the first person port of call would be to speak to your loved one about it. But um, you can appeal decisions. Um, you can also um, there'll be there's a complaints. Um, roll through the Mental Health um, Wellbeing Commission, but that's probably not part of our remit. And I'm sure you'll, you'll hear about that um, at some time, at some point. Okay, so any <laughs> questions? So look, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll have a look at the chat. And, and I can help out there too, Tracy. That'd be good. Thank yes. you, thank so you. So while you're, you're stop, while you stop sharing, I'll start with one from, Caroline, who said, who decides if uh, the order will directly affect the carer or the care relationship? Mm. It's a really... That considered? Yeah, it, um, it's a tough one. Um, tough audience, <laughs> i got to say. Um, um, really, our as a, a tribunal, our role really is to have regard to the, consider the criteria that's fundamentally in considering whether a, um, a treatment order should be in place or not. Um, having said that, um, we are compelled to consider, as I've already said, um, under the new legislation, and perhaps if I can speak to that, we are um, required to have, um, give proper consideration to the principles and, of course, um, um, importance of um, patients' voice and, and carers is, is part of that. Um, as I think I tried to make the point already, it's, it's not going to be I'll tick box of every single principle. It, it really is on a case-by-case -case basis. We'll have to um, be considering the relevance of, of um, different perspectives. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult one to answer, I, I have to say, because primarily we have to have regards to the criteria, um, but taking in, informing our decision-making, it might be um, uh, what, mum or dad has said or carer has said or um, and how that supports their what they've said and their concerns in supporting a person's recovery so I've, I've come about that in a very political way I've not answered the question at all but, um, but I think it's a, a it's a watch this space um, we as I've already indicated we try to practice solution focus um, in hearings um, we're not going to be able to solve the problems of the world but sometimes issues will be raised in a hearing when we can um, have an open discussion. Sorry. Pauline would like to know if the Mental Health Tribunal will return to face-to-face -to -face hearings. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I, can probably, <laughs> I can probably answer that one, um, Camille, if you like. Yeah. Um, at the moment, um, we're, we're staying online um, just because when it sort of all, all happened, um, there was before there was room set up, there was all, everything. Um, some health services have um, sort of taken out those those facilities and whatnot. Um, so we're staying online at the moment. We do offer a hybrid um, hearing if a person really wants face to face. So one member would go to the health services service and we would facilitate that. Um, interestingly enough, we've actually had um, an uptake in people attending their hearings since we've been online. Um, so I'm not saying no, that it won't um, eventually go back to face to face. But I think what one of the learnings that we have got from this is that with that uptake, and we do really want people to attend, um, there is something to be said for online 
um, hearings at, at the moment. But yes, we do intend on sort of looking at what that all looks like moving forward and going back to that and whether it's a hybrid model, um, whether we do do some face-to-face, -face, but that sort of is all work ahead of us. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Sarah asks, what measures is the tribunal taking to meet increases in demand that are expected once the new Act takes effect from September 1, uh, when maximum time for community treatment orders reduced from six from 12 to six months? <laughs> I think the answer is they've cancelled all leave, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the expectation is that, yeah, they're, we, I think they are expecting an increase. Um, and there's been a new recruitment round very recently. Um, I think we just have to work hard to absorb it. Um, I know um, currently, uh, well, Tracy, you can probably speak about the number of divisions yep. we have. Yeah, sure. Um, look, at, at the moment, um, we run between eight and nine divisions a day. We can, we have capacity, I think, to go up to 10 divisions a day. Um, we do have uh, new members who started uh, in June. We're increasing our registry staff. And look, even, even though we also anticipate that there'll obviously be more hearings, um, we are still legislated to hold those hearings within time, um, which we, we're well aware of that. So, yeah, like I said, at the moment, we, generally one run nine divisions about three days a week. Um, so we, we, we do have uh, room there to, to increase the amount of divisions and we are increasing our registry uh, staff to support that. Thank you. Um, I've a question from Dua. How does the tribunal balance the views expressed in advance statements with the views expressed? Whoops, I've just got it. Sorry, Dua. Do you want me to read it out, Wendy? That would be great because I've lost you in the so chat. That's okay. It's how does the tribunal balance the views expressed in an advance statement with the views and preferences expressed by the person at the time of tribunal hearings, particularly in cases where these are not the same? Um, it's a really great question, and I think you probably have to have regard to. Um, Sometimes statements are written, you know, many years ago, and of course, a person's views and preferences can change. Like all of us, views about things can change over time. Um, it's a, a question of balance, and I think case by case is probably the best answer I can give. Um, it might also depend um, the, the, on whether the person is uh, very unwell at the time. They may be, because ideally, um, event statements are made when a person's um, generally. Um, in recovery so it's, again it's about balance and and case by case my person might be extremely unwell and and um saying some things you have to have, certainly take on board what they're saying but um it's about weight really i think yeah i guess one of the the like background for that is that sometimes with the treating teams they haven't seen the person prior to them being in crisis so they only see them at the state or the expressed views at the time of the tribunal hearings, but, and they yeah. can be different. I'm going to stop talking now because no, there's no, no, but that's why it's really helpful to have um, uh, family or carers or support people around to say, well, you know, when Freddie blogs as well, he has, you know, these preferences, or mm -hmm. that's when it's helpful, I think. Thanks, Dua. Uh, another question, does a nominated person need permission of the person um, of the consumer to attend the tribunal? Um, sort of going back to um, what we touched on before and um, generally uh, they, I think as a nominated person, I think you're given notice of the hearing. Um, sometimes um, um, generally, I think the nominated person would be, um, if it's because it's a, it's a sort of a more formal nomination, it's a um, someone there's a question that popped up before about how do you do that, but it's generally you know formal signing um, 
person signs and gives their permission for someone else to, you know, nominates the other person. So generally um, they are invited as far as I understand. Um, of course, there may arise um, instances where the patient um, person subject of the order um, may have a view about whether the person should be there or not. And that might create another dynamic and a discussion, I think, about what the person being involved in the hearing. But generally, yes, I think so, should be involved. And Raoul has a question saying, what assistance does a person have, have to appear in what they could find a potentially intimidating and confusing process? Absolutely. What assistance for that person? And that's IMA. That's... Um, the opt-in, opt-out um, role of IMA now, as I understand um, uh, their senior advocate spoke with you some a little while ago and talked about the role of IMA. Um, and it absolutely is a very, can be a, a very daunting experience for um, the person who's the subject of an order, um, can be just really stressful. And I, I um, Again, I can only speak for myself, but I think um, you have to, I, I guess, take on board that um, we're not out to, the first thing I often say is we're not here to cause grief. Um, the last thing we want is for a person to find it totally traumatised by an experience of coming to the tribunal and, and being involved or trying to put forward their views and wishes. So we always try to work, um, I always try to acknowledge that, um, ways around it might be offering the person opportunity to say what they want to say, to leave if they need to, to have breaks. Um, we're, um, so we're not Draculas, we're not out to um, take people down. Um, um, I, I don't know whether, I'm sorry I'm so late, but um, my background is I have a loved one who has uh, mental illness. And so I think, and the psychiatrists obviously have most, have worked in the public sphere. So then we're not, um, as our community members have um, significant experience. So people who are generally very, very sensitive um, to how a person might be feeling, um, they're in the box seat. Uh, for yeah. many, they think they're in jail. It's often an awful experience for people. So we, I think, try to practice um, 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 as best we can. And, yeah. yeah. Can, can, I just, can I just jump in there for a second? Sorry. One of the things that we've worked really hard on, um, and this is with consultation with our advisor, TAG, which is our advisory group, which is made up of um, consumers and carers, um, is our communications to patients. Um, and we're very aware of trying to not make it to feel like a court. Um, and actually, we're, we're addressing um, our letters to the patients, in, you know, encouraging them to come along. We've changed the way that reports are written by, by the treating teams. So instead of it being a, a report that um, could be very um, sort of clinical in the past, it's now um, written to the patient and it's written about why do... Um, why the training team think they need to be on compulsory treatment. Um, so we've worked really hard on trying to change that and move away from it feeling like court because it's yeah. it's not court. So, um, and we will continue to work on on things like that um, because we really want as, as many patients and, and carers to attend as possible. Thank you. Rowena, I can see you have your hand up. We might take your question. I know we've got so many um, and we just won't, we just don't have time to get to all of them. But Rowena, what would you like to ask? Oh, thanks, Wendy. Yeah, Rowena from Wellways. Um, I, look, this is not a criticism. It's just uh, something to consider. How will the tribunal um, address past harms and um, trauma caused by the system um, for people, because I I know for myself, just thinking about my uh, person attending again is is just brings up a lot of trauma. Um, any any comments on that at all? 
I think um, with the work that we're doing, like I said, around um, the report templates and, and things like that, um, one of the things that um, we had discussed was that sometimes the, the training teams were putting in inform historical information mm -hmm. that can um, be traumatising and, and it can go back, um, you know, like, 20 years ago and maybe isn't relevant to the person where they're at at the moment so um, the way that we're sort of trying to get train teams to, to write um, reports and things like that is is to be sensitive to those sorts of issues so that um, you know it can be as less traumatizing as possible I think that with the IMA opt-out I, I think hopefully that that might help with um, some of that stuff as well, because um, a patient may not feel so alone. Yes. Um, they'll, they'll have someone, you know, that they can refer to. Um, so I hope that answers that question, Rowena. We also have... Oh, not really. I was, I was talking uh, about um, trauma perpetrated by the system, you know, people yeah. having their power taken away and being restricted... Um, for 12 months um, through a process of, yeah, not having their wishes, um, you know, realised. So, see, this is where I've got to step in. I don't, I don't understand this. What about, what about the carer at this point? When a person gets to the point where they need to be on a, on a treatment order, the carer is suffering bad. What well, this? Uh, I just don't understand. Has anybody not thought of that themselves during this process? And I think and maybe that's they're what traumatized. We... Obviously, they're traumatised. They've got an illness, a very serious illness, which needs all the care and concern that we can muster. We know oh, that yes. as carers. Yes. I agree. We're it's the hell. ones that are traumatised. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I agree too. It's about to be put on. Yep. Or, or coming to be putting on, we are really suffering. Yep. Yes. Yep. And the, the people putting the order on, thank God for the order. It's always going to be it's always going to be a really difficult uh, yes. space because I agree wholeheartedly that um, it falls back on um, for all the supports we have in place and NDIS, it falls back on the people that love and um, that, that are there, that pick up the pieces 24-7 every time. Yeah, and there's no uh, way to make it easy uh, or say it's, it's you know, no. wave it away. It's just, it's not. Yeah. And, and I think um, I agree. there's the expectations coming around the new Mental Health and Wellbeing Act that that will be a cure-all for, for yeah. everyone. And, and I think that makes it difficult as well because it, it won't be. Liz, you've got your hand up and I'm going to say that, Liz, this is the last question, everyone, because we also just want to um, provide you a little bit of an update from Joe on the Carer Recognition Act. So, Liz, what's your question, please? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, to the tribunal. Um, they've helped my, <clears throat> my son. He has a significant mental illness. And throughout all the years, yes, he has experienced trauma, but he's very unwell and he has no insight. And thanks to the tribunal, he does uh, continue treatment. Um, which is great. Um, another thing is um, I work on the helpline and I get uh, many, many calls from families and carers where, you know, the person isn't at risk. And, you know, like the previous question, um, families are really distraught because they don't know how to go about getting treatment. Um, if the person isn't at risk and they're, um, you know, really unwell, it can go to violence and then the police is involved why is it something done about that you know it's either the police or um involuntary admission there's sort of no middle ground i find uh there's so many people out there really really struggling i hear it every day um it, it's really sad because people are really really suffering a carers are suffering they get abused um, 
and they love the person they care for so much, but they're unwell and the person doesn't understand. It has to get to a certain, to that point for them to get treatment. What can we do? Why isn't anything done to prevent all this? I've been in the mental health system with my son for 20 years now. And yes, great. I'm very lucky. My son's not violent. He's gentle. Um, you know, he has an assignation, no insight into his illness, which I'm really lucky. But I hear from many other carers how they're suffering. And I'm sorry to bring this up, but it's a huge point that's not being addressed. I think um, yes, there's everyone probably here, including Tracy and Camille, that would yeah. agree with you. There is um, vast, yeah. vast gaps in the system. And, and as I said, the, the new Mental Health and Wellbeing Act won't fix things up. And I mean, obviously, we know you're talking about from a police perspective, they're looking at a health led response from an ambulance and paramedic perspective, but that won't happen, you know, like come the 1st of September, they're, they're, everyone will still be um, experiencing things that you're all experiencing now. I don't know how to answer your question other than to say we're hearing it on our helpline as well. So um, I just want to thank everyone um, for today. And I just want to remind you too that, that the, the issues and the things we've talked about today can bring up some very um, emotional and traumatic feelings for you. So please reach out to your um, supports. We've got our support numbers in the system. Um, and I really want to thank Tracy and Camille for coming along and providing this information. And hopefully going forward, once the, um, the acts rolled out a little bit, you'll come back and let us know how things are going. So thank you, um, Tracy and Camille. And I know this, is, this has been, um, as you said, a bit of a tough audience, but we're raising the issues that um, are very relevant to us. Absolutely. Yeah, no That's criticism um, intended, but no, thanks for the, thanks for no. the invitation. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity and, and absolutely um, we'll, we'll come back again whenever you, you want us to. So Thank you. Yeah. And for everyone, just to let you know, Tracy and Camille will share the slides um, so you'll be able to get a copy of those. But just before we head off, I'd like to hand over to Jo just briefly to talk about the work we're doing um, under the Carer Recognition Act. So that might finish on a little lighter note. Mm -hmm. Joe, are you with us? I am. Thanks, Wendy. Is everyone able to hear me okay? And we can see you. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so I know that it's 11, so if people need to head off, please, please do. Um, but um, I just wanted to quickly mention that um, there's an inquiry into Australia's Care Recognition Act. So as Wendy mentioned earlier, the Federal Recognition Act. Um, it's being undertaken by the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs. Um, the inquiry will, and I quote, examine the effectiveness of the Carer Recognition Act 2010 in acknowledging and raising, and raising awareness of the important role of unpaid carers in Australian society and will consider if legislative reform is needed. Tandem will be sending a submission to the inquiry and we're really keen for our membership to have input into that. Um, we'll shortly, hopefully later today, um, be emailing a survey around to our members to give people the opportunity to send us their insights and ideas if, if they would like to. Um, the survey will include questions about your experiences, if applicable, of federally funded services such as Carer Gateway, the NDIS, Centrelink and Employment Services. There's also a question about how understanding and flexible workplaces are in relation to carer roles or aren't, um, a question about how in inadequate service provision for the people you support might have impacted you and a question about what sort of carer rights you think should be in a reformed, in a possibly reformed act. Survey respondents don't need to answer all the questions, only those that are relevant to you and that you'd like to answer. Any and all input is very welcome. It would be really valuable to have your reflections inform our submission um, and to illustrate the points we'll be making with, with your quotes. Um, I, I should note that the survey is of course anonymous and any content that might possibly identify you or anyone else would be carefully de-identified. Um, and also if you don't want any of your comments 
evidence to appear in our submission as a quote, you can make note of that in your response. Um, the email that we'll be sending you will include a link to a guide we've written that explains more about the inquiry and also includes links to other relevant documents for more information. Um, you don't need to read the guide at all before completing the survey, it's just there for people who'd like a bit more background information and context. Um, it may be that um, individuals or peer support groups would like to write their own submissions as well. Um, and we hope that the guide we've written might also come in useful there if that's the case. So the survey will close on the 7th of August, as the closing date for submissions is quite soon, the 11th of August. Uh, we'll be sharing the survey link on social media and in Tandem's e-news this coming Tuesday as well. Um, so if anyone has any questions about the survey or the inquiry, please don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, my contact details will be in the email that's sent around. Thanks, thanks for your time, everyone. Thank you, Joe. And I just want to again thank everyone for coming along um, and, and hopefully the, the members, uh, Tracy and Camille, are able to take something away from your questions today, as hopefully you've been able to take something away from the presentation. Um, thank you all again so much for coming. Again, watch out for our newsletter with any updates on the next Tandem Time session, which is in September. So thank you, everyone. And again, if you need any support, please call Tandem on our 1800 number. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.